caffeinated, ready to do a whole day of a conference. <laughs> um, so we've got some amazing speakers and sessions lined up for today. Um, and uh, later on today, at the end of the day, we're gonna be actually having a film screening, which is really exciting, and the filmmakers will be here to talk about it. Uh, a, a film that's about a local community um, and a, a guaranteed income pilot that uh, sprang up there. So very exciting stuff for today. Um, and we're gonna just jump right into it. Um, so this first session is sort of uh, vaguely called just promoting economic mobility in early childhood. We never changed the title that was like our working title and then we just never uh, changed it to something more specific, so it's a little broad. But um, I can say, you know, as a parent of two young children right now, of a three-year-old and a one-year-old, uh, we know that early childhood is hard. It is hard for families, and uh, it is especially hard for families that are living in poverty. Uh, it is a tough time to uh, be trying to make it work for yourself and to, to provide everything you need for your families, and it is a very important time as many of us know, thanks in the large part to the work of uh, these two folks up here, uh, we now have a much greater understanding of uh, the importance of early childhood, why it's so important to make sure that children uh, early on in life have what they need in order to thrive. Um, so we've got uh, what I think is gonna be a really interesting conversation. Let me introduce our uh, two speakers. So first off, Dr. Leah Samuel is the president and CEO of the Center for Academic and Social Emotional Learning and a senior fellow at the Center on the Developing Child at Harvard University. Dr. Samuel is a bilingual executive leader with expertise from early childhood through higher education. During her tenure at the Department of Education, she served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Local, State, and National Engagement, coordinating with stakeholders in urban, rural, suburban, and tribal communities to build effective education programming. Prior to her federal appointment, Dr. Samuel uh, developed, analyzed, and implemented education policy as the Executive Vice President of Government Affairs and Partnerships at NWEA as the Executive, uh, as the Director of Education at the National Governors Association. In these roles, she worked with policymakers on both sides of the aisle to build evidence-based education systems that served children's needs. She has informed state policy agendas, assisted with developing cross-systems approaches to developing policy solutions to support children and families and leading systems level change. And then we have Dr. Schoenkoff. <laughs> so Jack Schoenkoff, MD, is the Julius B. Richard Family Professor of Child Health and Development at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and Harvard Graduate School of Education. He's a professor of pediatrics at the Harvard Medical School and Boston Children's Hospital and research staff at Massachusetts General Hospital and the director of the university-wide Center of the De on the Developing Child at Harvard. He chairs the National Scientific Council on the Developing Child, whose mission is to bring credible science to bear on public policy affecting children and families and the JPB Net, uh, Research Network on Toxic Stress, which is developing new measures of stress effects and resilience in young children. He has authored more than 180 publications, including nine books and monographs, and a landmark report from the National Academy of Sciences titled, From Neurons to Neighborhoods, The Science of Early Childhood Development. Dr. Samuel and Dr. Schoenkopf, thank you so much for being with us today. So I'd like to invite Jack just to get us started uh, with a very basic kind of overview of where are we uh, in the field of early childhood, what do we know, what are some of the emergent things that are coming out, and then we'll have more of a kind of conversation. Thanks, Nikki. I'm sorry to get up to the podium, but I can't see that far to the slides <laughs> to be able to walk through it. But um, it's really great to be here. It's great to be here with Empath. and. Uh, I'm going to give you just a little whirlwind tour of, of, of what we know about the science of early childhood and how that has informed the field and, and how it hopefully will inform the field differently going forward. So let me just say that early childhood policy, we've had early childhood policies for over half a century in this country, going back to the war on poverty uh, in the 1960s. But in the last 20 years, there's been a heavy emphasis on the underlying science of early brain development and how experiences shape the brain, and that has really kind of filtered through the general population. So 
Um, what I'm going to do is just going to give you, I'm not going to spend any time hardly on kind of where the science has been, but spend most of my time on where science is now and where the field has some important and untapped kind of resources. Uh, so science informed early childhood policy kind of really begins by understanding why early experiences are so important for the developing brain. And this is kind of in one graph I will illustrate for you. This is the curve of what's called plasticity or adaptability of the brain. What it basically says is that the brain is optimally adaptive and flexible and plastic at birth, and it's all downhill from there. Now, the, the first thing, that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but I know the first thing you're all looking for your age on that slide, don't worry about it. The, the important point here is that the brain never loses its capacity to adapt to new challenges, but it dramatically, it's so plastic, so adaptable at birth, and in the first couple of years, it, uh, it decreases and then kind of uh, continues to slow down. What I want to do is, is kind of say something about my connection to mobility mentoring, my connection to the organization, and how I have always felt from the first time we met that mobility mentoring and the kind of coaching that's done is kind of the missing piece in everything in early childhood. Because um, what happens in the beginning, in the first couple of years, a lot of things come in automatically. I mean, kids crawl and they walk, I mean, except for extreme exceptions. Um, but skills like being able to really focus your attention, to be able to regulate your behavior, follow directions, control your impulses, what we call executive function self-regulation, that most of the foundation for that, it starts in infancy with attention, but most of the foundation is in the three to five year age period. And it doesn't come in automatically, it comes in by modeling and coaching by parents, childcare providers, the people who engage with young children. And those adults who didn't have a lot of that foundation built early on, um, I'm not going to learn those skills by being given a cheat sheet to say, you know, focus on controlling your impulses and focus on following rules. So mobility mentoring and what it's all about, and we share this interest in the science of the development of these skills, um, it's been creeping into the early childhood field. It has to become a major part of the early childhood field and not just parent, giving parents advice. Um, because what happens is as the plasticity decreases, the energy costs to the brain go up. The brain has to work harder. Um, the older it gets, the harder it is to change and adapt to new challenges. So that's, that's been the heart of the brain science story for what we've really, um, how we've really thought about early childhood for the last, say, 10 or 20 years. So what, I, what I'm going to do now in just a few minutes is I'm going to give you a whirlwind tour of kind of, unfortunately, there's no time to kind of give you the data behind it, so you're going to have to take my word. I'm giving you the take-home <laughs> messages, right? There is a revolution going on in the biology of adversity and resilience. There is a revolution going on in terms of how everything, whether it's our health, our learning, our behavior, is influenced on an individual basis by the interaction between how, we, between how we are each individually wired by our unique genetic predispositions. There's nothing genetic about race or ethnicity or where you come from. Those are social constructs. There's no the Human Genome Project put the stake in the ground on that one. Um, there are no genetic bases for any of these classifications. But um, individually, each of us, how we are, what we do, how healthy we are, how competent we are, is a result of the interaction between how we are wired originally, which changes over time, and the experiences we have in our lives. So um, I'm going to just give you three take-home messages about three very solidly supported, universally accepted, based on decades of research, three core concepts of development that are rock solid and that provide a basis for us to think about how we might make the field stronger and might be better and more effective in the things we do. So the first is that everything that we've been talking about with respect to the brain, all, this, all these issues about how the brain is influenced by experience, um, it's true for every other developing organ system. It's true for the immune system. It's true for metabolic systems. All of them are reading the environment, and they talk to each other, and they talk to the brain back and forth. So this is not just about the brain. It's about all developing biological systems. Second, and this is the big one. This is the big one. It's, 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 so, it's at the heart of biology. is about variation in sensitivity to the environment. Every time we do a study, and we, we look for what is the average effect of this intervention. Every time we ask about what is the impact of poverty or racism 
on early childhood development, and we're expecting a generic answer, is completely contrary to what basic biology is all about, which is this huge variation in sensitivity. Um, on a common sense level, anybody here know anybody who has more than one child in a family? Um, if, it, if, if they're living, if they, if they share the same parents and live in the same home, um, so they've got a shared gene inheritance and they live in the same home and they're different from each other. And in every family can tell you if it's more than one child, one is more sensitive to what's going on than the other. If something goes bad, one gets upset faster than the other. Okay, we all kind of know that. Um, and there are lots of other examples, but I won't take the time for that. But we have to stop asking what's the best program for kids in poverty. Or even with due respect, that's why mobility mentoring is so important. It's individualized. It's not, you don't kind of take something off the shelf and give the same thing to everyone. Um, the next concept is the importance of timing and critical periods. So people, a lot of people know about this issue about how there are critical periods in the development of the brain. When the brain, anytime there's a critical sensitive period, it means that's when biological systems are most reading the environment and kind of building their, their circuits, if it's in the brain, or building their ways of reg regulating metabolism, if it's in cells. And we've known that there are critical and sensitive periods for the development of language and other behavioral issues, but also now there's a huge amount of knowledge that there are critical periods in the development of the immune system. From the, from the end of pregnancy until the first 12 to 24 months after birth, things happen as a result of exposures that are gonna kind of set the way the immune system is gonna respond. And differences, that whole issue of variability, nothing's been a better example than the experience of COVID. Okay, right, so what's the one thing we could say about COVID? It didn't affect everybody the same way, even though they were exposed to the same virus. Age mattered, pre-existing health mattered, where you lived mattered, whether you had a chance to kind of isolate or not. And racial differ the, the racial differences in, in COVID um, can be explained by so many different things, not the least of which is pre-existing medical conditions that made people more vulnerable, don't equally distribute through the population and they're not primarily genetic in any way. So what I'm gonna do is take those, I'm sorry to rush through, but um, if you're interested, go on our website and there's a lot of material to read about that. Um, but let me just kind of now say, this science, these new scientific concepts are basically saying to many of us in the field, it's time for a mindset shift. If we're gonna talk about science informed policy and practice in the early childhood field. And the mindset shift is not replacing what we had, it's expanding it, it's bringing it up to date, it's enriching it with new knowledge. So everything we've known from a science point of view is true, but it's 20 years old, and science doesn't stand still, okay? So the time is ripe for this mindset shift, and I'm gonna organize my comments and be finished in a couple of minutes, is to say that we're, we're starting to call the science of early childhood development as it is right now, for policy and practice as ECD, Early Childhood Development 1.0. The essence of it is that this is about early brain development in an environment of relationships. Adult-child relationships are the critical final pathway for development, and that's as strong today as it was ever. There's no, but there's an and. It's not a but, there's an and. And it's essential that we connect the brain to the rest of the body in a broader ecosystem and not just focus on the adult-child relationships without taking away from their importance. And I think mobility mentoring would certainly understand that. There's this intensive coaching model, but the people who are receiving services and working with folks at Empath live, live in an environment that, that is not necessarily just controlled by developing good executive function skills. So I'm gonna to propose to you today and, and to spend the rest of my life working on this, along with others who are invested, is that we have to leverage this new science to re-envision a much bolder early childhood agenda. Um, not replace what we have now, but build on it, because we live in a world of striking and growing inequality and uncertainty. All of the service systems, the lives that people have kind of struggled to maintain during this pandemic, I think most people would agree the challenge now is not how do we get back as quickly as possible to where we were, but what's, what are things gonna look like going forward? So I'm now gonna just breeze through a couple of the elements of where we're, we're proposing. This is informed by science, but there's a lot still to be worked out. So what, 
And the key issue here is there's new science, but there need to be more diverse voices at the table, not just the usual way in which we talk about diversity in terms of race and ethnicity and uh, economic status, but also more voices at the table. We need to be dealing with the lived experiences of families, the lived experiences of service providers who are working in a very tough environment. And I would say this is something really interesting getting into. The lived experience of policymakers and business leaders who are suddenly recognizing that child care, an early child, for example, is an existential threat to business. If you can't figure out how to make that work, you're not going to recruit or retain employees, and certainly not from a younger generation that, I don't want to expose myself as an old fart, but who are demanding much more uh, from their jobs and, and how they're treated, and we're just not going to get away with kind of the way things used to be. Okay. So here, here are some of the things that, uh, that illustrate this going from 1.0 to 2.0. So 1.0, it's, it's about readiness for school. It's still about readiness for school. And it's also about the early foundations of lifelong physical and mental health, just as much. It's not just an education issue. It shouldn't just be on the education budget, but it is a big education issue, but also health. ECD 1.0, it's about providing enrichment for young minds, providing enriched environments and centers, talking to children, reading to them, all of the things that people know about. It's as important as it ever was before. But it's also about protecting developing brains and other biological systems from the disruptive effects of excessive repeated stress activation and adversity. And also tailoring responses to differences that meet a range of child and family needs. The field has known this for a long time. People always said there's no one size fits all. Okay, but now we've got a lot more science that has a much more nuanced understanding of how right people are when they say that, but yet still we talk, we still ask what's the best program? What's the best program to, for people in poverty? It's still about child caregiver relationships. It's also about communities and business and government leaders working together to create a much more supportive and healthy environment in which all families are raising their children. And it doesn't mean that child care providers now have to figure out the answer to housing and food insecurity, and environmental pollutants that are unequally distributed across communities. What it means is people who work in those areas need to start bringing an early childhood lens to what they do. That's how the field expands, not asking child, early childhood service providers to take on these big problems, but not letting others off the hook. So where children live, this will be my last comment, uh, where children live presents assets and threats talking to the neighborhood level, that affect their health and development. Um, yesterday, you heard a wonderful session with Raj Chetty and Dolores Acevedo Garcia about neighborhood effects on uh, upward mobility. And um, Dolores, in particular, uh, didn't have a chance. She didn't go through her work as much, but she developed, it with her colleagues, a child opportunity index that collected data in the 100 largest metropolitan areas in the United States, 72,000 census, census tracts and gather data on all of these things that you can measure in a community that tell you something about what, where are the opportunities in the community for healthy development and upward mobility, and where are the threats. Range of things, the quality of, of early care and education services, quality of health services, how accessible they are, is affordable nutritious food there, what about air pollution, how far are you from a toxic dump, what about being close to highways, what about there are no trees, what about the fact that it's 10 degrees hotter, in an urban area than it is in the suburbs and the heat is getting worse. So all of those things, and we're able to develop an index for every single neighborhood that they studied that lets you know where you are on a scale of one to 100 about what's the balance between opportunities and threats. Or more specifically, where are the opportunities for healthy development? And here it is in vivid color about kind of where the problems are to help people understand what do we mean when we say that residential segregation is the result of deeply embedded historical structural inequities and not just where people choose to live, right? So just I'm gonna finish by telling you this slide looking at these 72,000 census tracts across 100 metropolitan areas and looking across the country, which covers about two thirds of the population of children in this country, 40% of black children are living in low, very low opportunity neighborhoods 32% of Hispanic children are living in very low opportunity neighborhoods. 9% of white children are living in very low opportunity neighborhoods. So the challenge for early childhood is to keep on, keep on trucking on 
parent-child relationships, on promoting early learning experiences, but figure out how we go upstream and start to deal with a lot of the factors that are really creating huge burdens for families with young children. So I will kind of stop right here. Thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. I'm gonna take a moment, um, and since I have the mic, use moderator mic privileges. This is so a full circle life moment for me professionally. Back in 2011, well, I'll back up a little bit more. 2010, I left my principalship, I was an elementary principal, to get into the policy world because I was so just done with policies impacting the practice of my school every day. And I started working, I, when I shift, shifted careers, I started working for an organization, it was a state agency called First Things First in Arizona. And we had $38 million of new state funding to fund early childhood programs from birth to age eight. I, um, as a newbie into the early childhood world, even though my dissertation work was in family intervention strategies, I had to get resources because we had to determine where we were gonna fund these, you know, how we were gonna fund this $38 million worth of funds. So I went to the Center on the Developing Child's website and had a chance to, Neurons to Neighborhoods was out, you guys had just rolled out the toxic stress video that I ended up using when we went to 29 different regional areas in Arizona. So I used all, used is a very nice word for saying stealing, I stole all the Center's work for my work in Arizona. Then I got called to become the director of education at the National Governors Association, and the center asked me to review a publication. I was like, oh, I've made it. I have made it. <laughs> but then... You said yes, and we made it. Yeah, I hear you, Jack, I hear you. And I've been working with Jack over the last few years on a, on a myriad of different things with the center. But to be presenting alongside Jack at this time, at this moment of history, it's I'm a fangirl moment. Like, this is a fangirl moment. <laughs> but also to take it just a little bit further, to be here presenting in front of you who are on the front lines, working with families, trying to help families, and that is how I started my career. It's like a double full circle moment. And so I just want to thank, take a moment to thank you for what you do every day, because it's a hard time in the field. It's a hard time for families. It's a hard time for practitioners. It's a hard time for those of us who are trying to lead mm -hmm. at a time when conversations that we should be having, people don't want to have. So I honor what you're doing on behalf of the families, and I'm going to take our conversation in a slightly different way, but it'll all come together during our discussion, I promise. We are in a unique moment in time. We have never been closer to hitting the reset button on public education, early childhood, policy. Everything is in flux. And I want to just say, while we're sitting here, all the while the ground that we're standing on seems stable, the plates are shifting underneath us, and it will settle. And when it settles, the world will look different. So we have to use this moment in time differently. This isn't on my slides, but it's something I think it's important to note. We are getting ready to enter a mid, well, we are in the midst of midterm season. Midterms are the first week of second week of November. There's 36 gubernatorial elections. There's over 450 congressional seats up for grabs. Then we talk about state chiefs, uh, school board elections, all these local elections that are occurring. And the number one political issue right now that has become a wedge issue is education in our families. So the work that we're doing now is on the ballot. And I won't tell you who to vote for, I won't tell you how to engage, but we have to use our voices because it will matter in the long run. And one of the things that's the undercurrent of the conversation is race, racism. And we have to just acknowledge it and call the thing a thing. So, what do you see here? What's more dangerous, the shark or the water? Anybody, just yell it out. Water? Anybody think the shark? Some say the shark, some say the water. So what this image really represents is racism. And the shark is actually not the most dangerous thing. It's the water because it's everywhere. It's in every system. It's in ev everywhere you turn, racism is present. Now, 
I will ask you to not tweet some of the things I say because the, the, the troll, Twitter trolls, I think is what they're, they're like, they're real, <laughs> but some of the things that I need to tell you today are also real. And so let's just agree, like church rules, what's, you know, we'll just be amongst us. So when we talk about policy, when we talk about politics, when we think about our families and their needs, we have to understand that they are operating within a, a construct where racism is real. It's part of their everyday life and it's at every circle that they turn. And so I wanna just pull out some data and I'm sorry these slides are so um, small, but we'll make sure that you guys get a copy. <laughs> when we talk about poverty, we already know black, Latino families are more likely to be in poverty and not just one generation poverty, multi-generational poverty. When we talk about medium in, median income, blacks and Latinos less likely to be at baseline. It's not a coincidence. When we talk about, um, I don't know, I, I, I don't know, I'd lost the title to this slide, so I don't know which one this is, but some, trust me, it's something. I'll get it in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all the time. Oh, so this one is on hunger. When we talk about hunger and food deserts, black families, Hispanic, and we won't even talk about tribal communities and the food deserts that they're dealing with. Again, so now we're talking about median income, we're talking about overall poverty, we're talking about hunger. Then when we talk about just overall net worth, Again, black and Hispanic families are at the lower end of the spectrum. And I come to this conversation to you, yes, as a well-educated person, yes, as a person who's been in education for 23 years, but also as a first-generation Latina who, has, who is watching this play out in my house at the same time. I, will, I don't think I've ever shared this with you, Jack, but when I tell you I have two boys, eight and 11, we're now on that back end of early childhood. My husband and I could not afford our first home till I was 39 and he was 40 and our boys were three and seven. Why? Student loans. Why? We had to save. Why? Early childhood costs are real. We were paying more in early childhood than we were for our rent at the time of the townhouse. So we couldn't afford a home. We couldn't afford it and here is I had a PhD, my husband's an engineer, and because we had two kids, and two of them that were in early childhood at the same time, we could not afford a home. We had to wait till one graduated out and went to public school, and then we were like, yes, we can save now. <laughs> and how many families have to make that choice? So this is not just for those families, it's families that, like me. Then when we talk about, um, I don't know why, the, none of the title slides are showing. Um, that's okay. I don't know what's, what happened with the transition, but so this looks at the different types of income, lower, middle, mid, and, and also the types of hardships that they are enduring. And what, I know that child care tax credits are a thing that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the differences between the two. And while the, those, that child care tax credit was such a lifeline for families, both with material hardships, but financial ones as well. Then when we talk about just kids getting access to early childhood, whether it's Head Start, black and Latino families are less likely to be able to have access. And we know access and opportunity are the gateway for change. Then as we talk about suspensions, now we're getting into education. We know that kids of color are more likely to be suspended by 18 months of age. By 18 months, Eight, like 18 months for biting. What 18 month old doesn't? For, so for the same developmentally appropriate behaviors, kids of color, particularly boys, are more likely to be suspended. So we know, again, just to recap, our families of color, more likely to live in poverty, more likely to have financial hardships, more likely to have hunger issues, more likely to be suspended, more likely to not have access and opportunity. What is the undercurrent? It's not race. It's racism, so we have to call the thing the thing. Then as we look at preterm births, so we're gonna switch to health. Women of color are more likely to go into early term delivery. Again, my story. Had a child, my first son Caleb, had him early. 
didn't know it was a thing. And here I was, older mom, was like 32, but still an older mom, and had access to what I thought high quality health care, and still all the signs were there, but didn't get the right access and ended up losing my son, my first son. So again, doesn't matter if you're a well-educated, middle-income person of color, your outcomes are more likely to still not be the same. So whether it's healthcare, whether it's financial, whether it's education, again, there is a through line. And it is one that we can no longer turn our eyes to and pretend that it's not there. It is there, it is real, and this is the construct in which our families are trying to op operate and survive in. So what do we do to change this? I mean, we're gonna dig into some policy discussion, which is what I love. I am a policy wonk and nerd because policies change people's lives. For the good or the bad, they do. But how can we change it? Number one, we have to think about our relationships with families and communities. They can no longer be transactional relationships. They have to be transformational. It can no longer be a one-sided, here's how we can help you. Those closest to the problems have the best solutions, and we're not engaging our families in a very real way. They know what they're dealing with. And so we have to move beyond that. Second, it's time to have a real community dialogue and not just put the pressure on the families because the families are operating within these constructs. So we have to start to move upstream, as Jack says, and start putting policies in place that help avoid the barriers or break down the barriers that are impacting our families when we talk about access and opportunity. The third, we are in this moment where we all have to lead from where we are. It is not the time for scared leadership. It is not. We all are leaders and you all are leaders. You're leaders within your organizations, you're leaders within your communities, you're leaders within your homes. And so as you hear this information, as you take everything you've learned over this conference, share it, share it. Leading is not just having a big title and a platform. Leading is, from, leading is leading from where you are, making change within your concentric circles. Because it is going to take all of us working together to break down the system of inequality and really start to have generational impacts. So with that, I'm going to turn it over and we'll go, continue Let's the chat. conversation. Okay. <laughs> I almost don't know where to start. That was so, so much wonderful information uh, all, all at once. Um, but I think that where I want to jump in first is um, it, it sounds like for both of you there's, there's sort of two levels uh, of programmatic intervention that we can, or broader intervention that we can kind of think about, one being with the families themselves and then one being sort of broader uh, systems level, right, moving beyond the families. So let's start with the families, right? And, uh, Dr. Samuel, you've thought a lot about this idea of parent partnership or parent family engagement. Um, can you talk about sort of why that's important? What do you think works there? What's the potential there um, for designing sort of programs that are really going to move the needle mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to the kind of parent uh, or family partnership? Mm -hmm. So uh, this parent piece and the, the integration of parent voice and really thinking about how to develop programs is something that's impacting my day-to-day -day work, but then also just holistically as we, as we look at the world. We saw firsthand how COVID made families truly front and center on all things. And so families have gone through this experience and they have a wealth of information that we're not tapping into. And so one of the things I would encourage you to do is really not think about how you bring families in. Not just your traditional parent night or a flyer, but how are we really integrating the voice of our families? And we have to understand all that's on families' plates. So are we being flexible with time? Are we reaching out to them? Are we still using technology? Because so many parents were able to engage in a different way because we offered them Zoom versus in person or non-traditional hours. And so as we try to go back to normal, I would challenge you to not. 
think about what, how we can use innovation and our family voices differently. And also thinking about which families we're engaging with. Because so often it's the same families that we go to and they often have a few more supports or availability than those families who we are really trying to reach. I also am a huge proponent of thinking about as we bring in these families, how do we then circle back and honor their voice and their time? How do we make sure that they know, I heard you, I saw you, and here's how your, your impact or your feedback is changing how we approach the work? Because so often we harvest this information from our families and our parents, but then we don't go back to them and say, here is what changed as a result. And so it really needs to be a bi-directional conversation, but they also have a right to know, what did you do with my effort and my time as well? Do you want to add anything, Chad? I, I yeah, bet I, you do. I, aside from just um, saying amen to what, um, what Aaliyah just said, I, I think this is, there's, there's a, this is a slippery slope of paying lip service to kind of whether you want to call it parent engagement or um, kind of more, you know, less, uh, less asymmetric relationships. The, the idea of parents having a voice and being at the table was one of the cornerstones of the development of Head Start in 1965, right? And, and we're like, what, 55, 60 years later, and we're still having conferences on how to enhance parent engagement in programs. It, I remember at one time I was at a conference, I said, I'm never getting up and speaking about this again. It's kind of like, just, but because all we do is talk about it, right? And I, I think from my own perspective, and I really appreciate, I always really appreciate your amazing ability, Aaliyah, to combine scholarship with personal experience and just kind of really nail both sides of that. It's that, I, I personally, I'm a pediatrician by training. I started out working in a community health center in the South Bronx. That's what I thought I would do for the rest of my life and be a, be a doctor um, for families and with young kids. And, and I kept going back and forth because it just seemed I wanted to make a bigger impact, but I couldn't make a bigger impact, so I kind of back make an impact on where I am. But you know, the real issue here is we haven't learned, we do not have a history of learning from what have we learned from the times we've tried this. These are not new ideas. And does anybody know where you find out? So what's been learned about what worked best in terms of really creating a table where parents had an equal seat with others? And where did it not work? And why did it not work? And so I think we have to just get serious and move from rhetoric to action, and from my perspective, this may be a, a kind of self-protection mental health thing on my part, I've begun to feel that the way to change the whole system of the whole country is to find a place where you can actually try some things where it's safe to try things and fail, and where it's safe to be honest about what we're doing, and then tell everybody what we learned, because the way we set all of our programs up, everybody who has a program or works in a system that survives and continues to get funded, knows that your job is to collect data to show you're making a difference so that you get your funding renewed and not to kind of really look at what you're doing and say, what's working and how do we double down on this and tell others about what we found to work because it always has to be adapted for different mm -hmm. communities. But also to say, what did we try that didn't work? Like, what can we learn from it and tell everybody so that people won't keep doing the same old thing? And I think that's, that's at the heart of, of your really important point, Ali, about moving, you know, from a kind of a transactional to a more transformational model. It's exactly right, but what have we learned uh, about how to do that? And I think that's the challenge, and I'm sure there are a lot of people in the room here right now who could begin to think about um, not how can I change the country, but how could I do something where I'm working that could be a model to show people how to move in that direction. Can I just add to that, Jack? I think it's important to note, to your point, that this is a moment that can become a movement. Mm -hmm. So we are in this moment in time. We do need these examples, both locally, but and at, if, when we look back at our history, to your point that some of this is not new, these moments in time created huge national movements, and if you look fundamentally when our nation has changed, do you know who was behind that? Parents. Jack just brought up Head Start, parents. The civil rights movement started by parents who were fundamentally exhausted and felt like their child had a fundamental right to an education. And it started with parents locally that used a moment to create a movement. 
and we need to be doing the same right now for early childhood because our kids of now are our adults of later and we are the ones that are going to be leaving the world behind for them. So I, I, don't, I want to underscore that that's how we need to be thinking about this. This is a true moment in time to create that movement. And we're not powerless. We're not, because I'm a parent, so I say we. We're not powerless. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of the folks in this room, you know, are part of that movement and are, are working to, to push that movement forward. We have a lot of folks in this room who work in early childhood designing new ways of moving from that transactional, what you were talking about before, the transactional kind of relationships with families, to really more of a transformational relationship where they're, they're sort of uh, looking more holistically at the family, engaging them as equals with deep respect, deep dignity uh, in the interaction. And, um, and so I, I have to say, the folks are here. We're here. We're doing it, right? <laughs> Great, so let's move um, now to talking about sort of some of the broader um, issues. So Jack, when we talked before, you talked about, you know, you can't put the entire onus on the family. It's not fair. They're, like uh, Dr. Samuel was saying, there's this water that's everywhere that the families are in. And if we're not changing uh, some of the broader issues, um, it's, it's really not fair to just say, oh, you know, read, read more to your child. <laughs> um, or, you know, here's their developmental screen, you know, what are some of the broader things that um, you think will move the needle the most? And either one of you is welcome to start. I know you both have. Dr. Samuel, you have some uh, great recent experience, so. <laughs> yeah, so um, I was a presidential appointee for 11 months. And uh, in that 11 months, I learned a lot about the sausage making of policy and really who gets to make the decisions for so, so many of us. And getting behind that curtain, I was like, oh, I thought I knew policy, but now I have a totally different perspective. And when we talk about moving things upstream and we talk about this moment in time, I cannot stress to you enough the importance of getting out and voting this November. I, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. I've worked, always worked in bipartisan organizations. I believe every person has a fundamental right. But we also need to encourage our families to vote. Because many of you receive federal, fundings to, federal funding to support your, your programs. And your fam many families depend on federal funding. And our, this election will matter. It will matter. Give you an example. I watched the child care tax credit changes happen behind the scenes. And some of it I can't share because I do have a federal security clearance and I took an oath so I can't share. But what I can share is the negotiations that happen behind the scenes between a very small elite number was extraordinary to watch. Better yet, when it came time to determine whether or not they were going to extend the 3600 um, a month plus the extension for a child under six, it was one senator, one senator who was a multimillionaire who said no. And as a result, almost four million families, four million, stopped getting that additional fund, those additional funds. One, one senator. So when we talk about the impact to families and paying attention to these elections, it's huge. I, wanna, I actually went through it because I, I wanted to have it fresh in my mind. So for those almost 4 million families, it was 3.7 to be exact, that lost that additional funds at the end of 2021, what the research is now showing a year later, uh, University of Michigan just published some research. Not only did it help families, it doubled their credit line so families actually were able to save, and so not credit like credit card, but credit line, like they were able to save some money, they were able to pay bills on time. I remember <clears throat> worrying month to month about paying my bills on time. Imagine the stress relief that that did for those families who knew they could pay their electric bill on time. 3.7 million families lost those funds because of one senator at the, at the negotiation table. Also, one of the things we knew, they were able to buy food. When we talked about financial hardships versus material hardships, they were able to avoid those holistically. We're talking about families that were depending on about $300 extra a month. But yet the power of one, 
So when we talk about what this means federally, the Build Back Better plan did not pass, and we can't talk about why, you know, how we're going to support our families if they can't get access to simple things. So holistically, this moment of time that I keep talking about will matter. There are a lot of federal funds that will be on the table for discussion. And if we don't want to see those dollars cut, reduced, or eliminated altogether, we need to be paying attention to this election cycle. There is a lot on the table. Jack, I could go on more, so, <laughs> but I won't. <laughs> So I'm going to expand the challenge here in terms of these people who stop things from happening. Um, so we tend to think when we say, so what are the things that affect early childhood? So usually these are things that before kind of issues around health, issues around education, issues around financial security. Um, but this notion of, of, of broadening our lens for what we think is relevant for early childhood, um, there's another one. I think you know a lot of controversial decisions Supreme Court came down on in June. Um, one that got much less attention was how they put huge strangulation around the Environmental Protection Agency about its ability to regulate um, pollutions, toxins in the environment. And people, you know, so that was an issue for um, the climate community. It was an issue for the environmental community. Nobody really seemed to think of that as an issue for the early childhood community. Well, guess what? So. Um, I learned about lead poisoning in medical school. That was quite a while ago. Um, and we still have lead in the pipes for drinking water. Flint, Michigan, Jackson, Mississippi, right? Um, not a lot of fancy suburbs, but that costs money to fix those pipes. We still have differences in exposure to pollution and where are the toxic dumps and who lives close to the toxic dumps and who doesn't. Nobody thinks about that as an early childhood issue. Well, so here's, here's a little kind of 30-second crash course in biology, so let's just take lead, but it'll, it'll be true for a lot of other things, like insecticides for migrant workers, right, working in the field, but just take lead. If there was a certain amount of lead in the water that everybody here drank, it wouldn't hurt us, wouldn't hurt us. As adults, um, very low lead levels don't affect, all of our systems already developed. Um, if children were exposed to that same level of lead, it would cause problems for them. If babies were exposed to that low level of that same level of lead, it would cause big problems for them. If fetuses were exposed to that low level of lead, it would really be much more severe than any others, and it would be responsible for some of the birth complications and the prematurity and other issues. So we don't think about that, but when you start to think about how much we know about what influences healthy development and what influences learning, we shouldn't say, so therefore, parents of young children, when you're out there mobilizing, make sure you take on the environmental protection. No, we can't ask, and we can't ask childcare providers to kind of have power in that, but we should be educating and asking and demanding that the environmental folks um, put an early childhood face on this. Make sure that that's on the table, because it's real. It's real, and maybe if there was more public understanding of how devastating the environmental protection handcuffs are now to babies and fetuses, maybe there would be more public discussion about that. So I think this is part of the issue where the science by itself, well, proof, this is not new science. Science by itself has limited power. Uh, the science aligned with uh, people who are representing parents, communities, Responsible policymakers who actually want, I, I, you know, there are a lot of policymakers out there who don't want to see bad things happen to kids, but it seems like they're not producing a lot of good stuff. It's part of this issue of widening the lens of how much we know about how important the early childhood period is. And to your point, Aaliyah, that you made indirectly and directly, is also we can't, as critical as it is to kind of have an authentic, empowered parent voice at the table. We can't put this on the backs of parents with young kids to kind of have to be able to take on the Supreme Court, right? So that's the issue. It's broadening the lens and then being strategic and figuring out where the right alliances are going to have some real power in a very difficult political system that we live in. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's so important because, you know, 
parents of young children are tired. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> they got a lot on their plate, and um, we know that you know there's a lot of protections for seniors because seniors get out and they vote. They have you know the time to do that. They have the time to get engaged, and unfortunately, we don't have a good organized voting block for parents of young children, for young, young children in general. And um, yeah, we can't put it all on them. <laughs> They've got enough on their plates now. We need sort of everybody to get behind uh, realigning our systems to better serve uh, young children. Great, so I wanna um, turn us now to some questions from the audience because I know that lots of folks here are likely very excited uh, to interact and engage with you both. Um, so folks can raise their hands. There'll be some microphones coming around. And I'd just like to um, remind folks to please get directly to the question um, and uh, just don't hug the mic. <laughs> Good morning. Thank Good morning. you so much for your conversations. Uh, Dr. Shankoff, I had a privilege of hearing you speak in DC at the Power of Place convening, so thank you. Just thinking about brain development and how, um, how we can equip families with that knowledge uh, as an avenue for advocacy um, and really being able to take one moment, you know, moments of preschoolers at our center being expelled because of behavior. Um, but those one-off moments lead to these larger statistics of suspension and expulsion even at 18 months, right? So how do we take those one-off moments um, and turn those into movements for advocacy um, with parents and those proximate voices at the center? Um, also knowing that, you know, as a community-based organization, like many of these in the room, uh, we're also navigating our spaces um, in being proximate voices, but also kind of being that liaison uh, with some of those policymakers and other, you know, systems uh, that we work with. So balancing all of those different um, stakeholders, but also taking those movements, uh, taking those moments and turning them into movements. Thank you. So it's, it's a great question, and uh, there obviously isn't an easy answer to that, but I'll tell you one thing that, um, that I've learned over the years. Uh, Back in the day, back, you know, um, kind of when we first started putting the brain science uh, material on the table, um, we actually had a state-based strategy and preferentially, that's how I first met Aaliyah. It was like, oh my God, this was like gold to kind of have somebody this good at the National Governors Association. Very politically polarized organization, right? But we decided to target conservative states. Um, Figured it was, I mean, it feels good to go out and preach to the choir and have everybody excited, but I don't know how that changes things. So we targeted conservative states. We targeted, we went to Kansas, we went to South Carolina, we went to Nebraska, Oklahoma, um, most, the Mississippi, yes, thank you, Mary. <laughs> and we, um, in the Delta, absolutely. And we, um, we, went, we, we started working with the most conservative people there, actually through connections with NCSL and, and GA. Um, those people who are really the far right now are, kind of pretty moderate compared to the way things are now. So that, that's a whole other story about context. But what, what we learned was that especially if you're coming in from the outside, uh, no matter how much good information you have, telling people what to do doesn't get you very far. So we kind of learned early on, we set up this, this um, kind of project to mutually educate each other. Um, they, they taught us about how their, their place works and how they make decisions. And we taught them about what some of the clear, universally accepted principles were in science, and it got them to start thinking in different ways. In fact, I remember being, I can't, forgive me, Mary, I don't know if there's Mississippi or Alabama, and I don't mean to over-stereotype those two states, but I gave a talk, and a state legislator come up to me afterwards and said, I'm re that was really interesting, it's making me think about our child welfare system where each caseworker has 90 cases and they can't really be doing a good job. And I said, well, you're right. And I said, why didn't you say that in public? She didn't want to say it publicly, right? And in other states, in Kansas, the Speaker of the House, who was very conservative Republican, got really fascinated by this issue of, of children being separated early on from their parents and how that was traumatic for them, even if it was a tough situation. He came out and came out for home visiting um, and a focus on mental health. And the press was blown away and they said, where did that come from? And he said, well, if the advocates tell me to do this, I'm not going to do that. But if the parents want this in Kansas, we'll do that. So I learned, like everything else, I mean, 
to, each of us have strong opinions and it's hard for people to change our minds about things, right? But if you give people information and engage them and make it real and make it human, um, people start thinking differently. At least people of goodwill do. I think there are still enough people of goodwill in this country. There are a lot of people of bad will in this country right now, but there are a lot of people of goodwill who vote against these kinds of things. And um, I think it becomes politicized immediately as opposed to helping people understand what we're learning. Um, and that's, that's all, all of these things are kind of a long haul. Mm -hmm. They're not a quick fix, and that's, yeah. And I think I would just double click on ja what Jack was saying about telling stories. And really right now, um, I, and, you know, I'm so transparent about my story because people pay attention when they see themselves and they're like, oh, well, yeah, I know, I've been through it or I know somebody who's been through it. And so I think we have to really continue to go on an amplified storytelling campaign right now. It is, and it's not necessarily the families telling their stories because oftentimes there's a trauma that happens when you have to continuously retell your story. But I think positioning ourselves to be able to tell stories and positioning those in, pow in positions of power to put faces, names to the stories and the realities. And to your point um, on the parents with the suspension, helping them understand that it's not just them, it's not just their child. And it, you know, there's an informing process, but it's also a supporting process and then a storytelling process. And uh, you know, I, I have found, and I, I look back at my own career and I was like, God, I was great at giving parents information, but I didn't support them afterward. And so if I could go back and do that again, I would, um, but that's why I use this platform the way I do to, on behalf of those families that, that we all represent. But I think we need to support them through the process. You know, for that parent whose child is suspended, it's painful. It's painful for that parent. And then they're wondering what, my gosh, this is my baby, or, or what did I do wrong? And so that creates a sense of shame where they don't know what to do. And so how do we support them so that they know, listen, it's not just you, and here's, how, here's what we can do to help you, um, I think is just really powerful. I want to add something. I, um, I don't know if it's still available. We should see the tape of the, the recording of you testifying at that congressional hearing a couple of, was a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month ago. So we have this other really kind of toxic thing that we're dealing with right now, which is this demonizing of, of any time anybody brings up the word racism. And also um, the, the spillover into deciding to target social and emotional learning as a communist plot, right? And I think that Aaliyah had a situation of a representative, it was somebody whose name I didn't even recognize, who was concerned about all these programs in the schools focused on social and emotional learning, and she singled out a program that was trying to teach kindness to children and asked if that was a Marxist plot to teach kindness to children. Now, you could, you listen to that, and you kind of think, how do you respond to that, right? How do you respond? But I, I will tell you, I've been in two states that I will not name um, in the last two months that um, are, um, they're, they're kind of, well, I won't describe them anymore, but to say that in one state, the people who were asked me to come, the early childhood folks, said they were really excited about the fact that this was a, a new administration, uh, fairly conservative, that was interested in early childhood and wanted to explore things. And, and three days before I went, they contacted me in a panic. They said they just heard from the people in the governor's cabinet that if the word racism comes up, they're not gonna continue the conversation. They don't wanna hear about racism. So they said, please don't mention racism. So what, what that said to me is, and we have to have lots of different voices figuring out how to educate people about what racism is and what it means in a way that will just get more people who immediately shut their eyes and shut their ears to start to understand what that is. And I think that's, um, so I think some of us um, um, have to kind of um, figure out how to talk to part of the country where it's a non-starter when you put the word on the table and break through that barrier. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I, I would just, you know, say to that, Amen. It's a hunt, you know, and, and part of this conversation about race, which is why I think a race, racism, why it's so important to put the stories behind it, is because there's this perception that in some cases that 
you know, poverty is the code for racism, or racism really is for like those group of people when it really impacts everyone in every way and every system. And so I think being able to Jack's point, bring a diverse community of people together, also holistically, whether it's social emotional learning, whether it's race, there's a, it's, it is a small percentage that have been the vocal majority because so many of us and myself included, have sat back and just been like, this is crazy. And we just shake our heads and keep going. And because we haven't used our voices, because we haven't moved from just truly shaking our head like, did they really say that? This is crazy, and just keep going. They have continued to gain the steam. And not only that, they are so well coordinated and strategic. Mm -hmm. So while we're shaking our head and just, you know, keep trucking along and doing our work, they are coordinated, they are strategic, and they are intentional, and they are a few. Which is why I think it's so important in all the spaces that we, we each occupy to be able to say the thing. Also, in the field of education holistically, there are people who are outside of us making decisions for us. It's time to have, make them have a seat and have us speak for us. And you know, I'm sure you've heard the saying, don't do anything for me without me. It's time for us as educators, whether it's early childhood, K-12, practitioners, home visiting, all these different tenets of education to fundamentally get coordinated and say, no, 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 we're back at the table. Because if not, these decisions by a very few who are not in the field will continue to impact us. And if we think we were bludgeoned before, folks, buckle up. This election cycle, if you look at some of these candidates, you will not just shake your head, you will like have nightmares. And so we have to get coordinated and strategic and resume our rightful power. Yes. You know, thank you. <laughs> so you, ju you just reminded me, Aliyah, about one other thing that really has to be taken into consideration in terms of this mindset shift that the field needs. Early childhood policy programs intervention from the beginning has largely had a poverty lens to it. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's ironic that the two iconic demonstration projects in the 1960s, one in the 60s and one in the 70s, the Perry Preschool Program and the Abbasidarian Project, that, kind of, that, that were the, the proof of concept that we can shift, they both were 100% African-American children and families and they were not talked about as dealing with racism, they were talked about as dealing with poverty. And the fact that, that racism, that race has been an issue when we look about differences and outcomes by race, and to your point, which is absolutely right, is this is racism, but we're talking about it's not race, is we have not really yet incorporated a racism dimension to the early childhood field. It's been about poverty and it's kind of equated the two. And they obviously are confounded, but they're not the same thing. And so that's, I think, part of our reframing of the early Hutch agenda is to figure out how we call it for what it is, that it's, it's a lot about poverty. It's a lot about deeply embedded structural inequities, some of them involved in intergenerational poverty, some of them involved in systemic racism, some of them involved in lots of other things. And people don't, we haven't confronted the fact that all of these things have to be on the table and they have to be discussed, including immigration status, including all of these other issues. So this is, we gotta figure this one out. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm a, my own conference worst guest. Now we just okay. closed our conference and the, you know, the speaker that went over, I was like, oh my God, get her off. But I just wanna say one other thing and I promise I'll be quiet, I promise, I promise. Going back to reclaiming our power, when the pan when when by the time June of 2020 came and childcare facilities weren't all open, there were some that were parents weren't going to work. It made Congress pay attention. They were like, "Oh my God, more than half of my workforce isn't showing up. Oh, we got to get these parents working." And it was a moment for us. And I think we missed it, but I digress. But even right now, there's this whole conversation of how do we get parents working again? How do we make sure our economy is stable? And I, this is an opportunity for us to be able to say, if we want our families to be able to go back to work, 
if we want our national economy to really stabilize, here are the tenets that we need in place. Here are the supports that our families not just deserve, but should be demanding. And so we're creeping up on another really big moment that I think we all should be paying attention to, because all these workforce gaps are now rising more than ever again. So we can't miss the moments, and sometimes they look different. Sometimes it's from an economic perspective. Sometimes it's education. But when we see the moment, we've got to take it. Okay. I'm sorry. And I'm going to jump in now. <laughs> because I'm over there. <laughs> I love you guys, and I could honestly listen. I, I, I wish we could do this all day. <laughs> but we have some other really wonderful uh, breakout sessions that are going to start right now. Um, and so in this room, we're going to have a breakout session about uh, diving deeper into early childhood. So we have some wonderful folks who will talk more sort of like uh, programmatically, you know, what does it look like? What are the ways to integrate uh, economic, economic mobility supports into early childhood uh, programming? Um, so that will be in here if you want to talk more about early childhood. Or uh, Dr. Samuel was talking about the importance of sharing stories, and we talked a lot about the sort of uh, importance of shifting narratives. So there will be a narrative session that is downstairs. You're going to go down one floor to the alumni lounge. It's a beautiful room. Uh, and we'll have a really fantastic panel uh, talking about the issue of shifting the narrative from a number of different perspectives. Um, and it's going to be a really fantastic session. So there'll be some staff to help guide you downstairs. Um, but so please uh, make your way to the downstairs lounge if you like. There's some coffee and pastries if you need them. Uh, and once again, let me just say, Dr. Samuel, Dr. Schoenkopf, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. That was fun. Thank you, John. You did. Okay.